Welcome to the Freedom Project podcast. The Freedom Project exists to make freedom in Christ known to each and every person we can reach and to encourage and dialogue with those who have already found freedom in Christ. Your host is Joe Weber. Hello friends, Joe Weber here from the Freedom Project. So happy you can be with us today. Today we're going to bring you something a little different. We're going to bring you a taped testimony of a man named Dan Bowman, who was held hostage in a Iranian prison for nine weeks. He's got a great story. Uh, we bring you that in cooperation with the Voice of the Martyrs. Right now we're gonna have a video from CBN News and then welcome Dan Bauman. Amen. You guys love Jesus? <laughs> Amen, me too. <laughs> It's that devotion to his Christian faith that took a young man from California all the way to Afghanistan. After first volunteering and working at an eye hospital, Dan Bauman then set his own sights on neighboring Iran. And in 1997, what was supposed to be a two-week trip turned into a nine-week nightmare as a prisoner of the Iranian Islamic regime. In my walk with the Lord in many dangerous places, I've always seen God come through. And all of a sudden, the thought hit me, well, what if this is different? Iran's government falsely charged him with spying and for being a missionary, charges that carried two separate death sentences. It was out of my hands. There was nothing I could do. Either God would do a miracle or I would stay there. He writes about his experience in a book called Cell 58. Alone in a small dark room, his only interaction, interrogations and beatings by prison guards. Broken and afraid, Dan decided his only escape was to take his own life. Four times I tried to kill myself, but every time I tried, I was too scared to tie the other end. In his final failed attempt, Dan had a vision that broke the despair. And I remember lying down on the ground in that moment, all of a sudden the room fills with this glorious light. And I turn around to see what's going on, and there is Jesus. And it was at that lowest point that He met me. The turnaround provided hope, an ability to keep going, and strength to forgive and even befriend the guard who regularly beat him. It also gave him the courage to boldly proclaim his faith in front of his accusers and an Iranian judge. And for about 20 minutes, I just preached the gospel. And I told everyone in that courtroom and I told everyone who could hear me all about who Jesus is, all about how much he loved him. All of a sudden, I realized something. I am free. I am free. So what if they kill me? My life is bought by the blood of Jesus. My home is in heaven and no one can take that away. In the midst of death itself, God gave me the grace to stand up and speak the truth. And in doing so, it brought freedom in my heart, knowing that this life isn't it. There is more and I'm going home one day and no one can take that away. After nine weeks, the head judge announced Dan's release. Today, Dan Bauman's unshakable faith and commitment to God extends to the next generation, training, equipping, and encouraging young people to serve in missions. George Thomas, CBN News. It's great to be with you today, and it's great to be able to talk about the goodness of God. You know, I grew up and I always heard that God was good. But the more I started walking with God, the more I realized there's probably a better way to say it. And that is that God is really good. And then life would go on and I'd realize, well, what? that's not the best way to say it either. But maybe a better way is that God is really, really good. <laughs> the more I get to know Jesus, the more I realize that he's really, 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 really good. <laughs> And I know that might sound like really deep theology, but I think the Christian life is just adding another really. <laughs> that God is really, really good. I grew up in Los Angeles. My dad was a carpenter. My mom was a housewife. We had a wonderful life. And then as we got to know Jesus, we began to experience and know his heart for the world. And God began to lead us all over the world. Both of my sisters decided to move overseas, and that was very much my journey as well. And I decided to go and share the love of Jesus. The more you discover the love of Jesus, the more you want to let people know. And as I began to follow the Lord and began to see what he had for me, the Muslim world became very, very intriguing for me. 
And God began to challenge me and think about spending time of living in the Muslim world. It's a really, really long story, but yeah, I decided I was 23 years old to move to the nation of Afghanistan and decided to work there for 10 years where I worked at a hospital. And it was there that I began to fall in love with Muslims. I love Muslims. I'm so grateful that so many Muslims have been a part of my life and I've gotten to have friendships with them. And it was there in Afghanistan that I got to live with them, work with them. The only way in the country at that time was to work at a hospital, and it changed my life. I learned the language and began to work there, spending time with people. While I was there, God began to put an interest in, in, in my heart towards the rest of the world around there, especially Iran, as Iran has the same language as Afghanistan. Long story short, me and my friend were praying one day, and we decided to go on a short trip into Iran. My friend was South African, and with that, there was an embassy in Tehran that he was able to get a visa. I'm a dual citizen. My dad is from Switzerland, so I have a Swiss passport and then an American passport. And I was using my Swiss passport because Switzerland also had an embassy in Tehran, in Iran. Long story short, we got a two-week trip into Iran. I'll never forget that trip. So, so grateful to go into Iran. I love Iran. <laughs> Iran is one of the most wonderful places I've been to. We had two amazing weeks, invited into their homes, invited to eat their food, enjoying them as people, and I just fell in love with them there. It was such a privilege to be able to hear their hearts, I don't know if you know, but it's one of the fastest growing churches in the world today is in Iran. God is moving, moving, moving. And there's such a hunger among the people. You might not hear that from a political rhetoric, but among the ma masses, there is so much hunger. Every night we would sit in their homes and enjoy their food. And we had just a wonderful two weeks. But it was at the end of those two weeks that things changed. We're on a local bus, we get to the border, and as we get to the border, they take our passports. As they take them away, we're just waiting to get them stamped and given back. And they don't do that. Those that were with us on the local bus are getting ready to leave. And the bus driver comes up to us and says, are you coming? We're like, yeah, we're coming. We just need our passports. And the bus driver left. It was about six hours that they came to us and said, yeah, there's uh, something wrong with your passport. We're like, well, what's the problem? They said, come with us. There was no explanation. We walk into a building, and that's when they said, yeah, we want to talk to you privately. And that's when they took me to one room and my friend to another room. And that's when they began to beat me. For about six hours, they kicked me and spat on me and hit me. There was no explanation. They finally dragged me out of the room. I had no idea where my friend was at that point, and then they dragged him into the same common room, and they'd been doing the same to him in a different room. That's when they took away our glasses. They blindfolded us. As they blindfolded us, they led us outside, throwing us in the back of a van. I was listening to them, I speak their language, and yet there was no explanation why this was happening. We drove for about 20, 30 minutes to another building where they continued to beat us. They finally took all our clothes away, put us in prison clothes, and without any explanation, they led me down these stairs, and they put me into one room and my friend into another room, and we were in prison in Iran. My name is Greg Musselman. You know, this is the 50th anniversary for the Voice of the Martyrs Canada serving our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world living in hostile and restricted nations as they continue to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right now, we're going to watch a video about our work around the world. Jesus Christ was beaten, mocked and misunderstood. He endured the cross and despised the shame. Though the King of Kings he was persecuted and died for our sake. In this world we will face tribulation, but you promise you'll be 
right here with us. And he said to his followers, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. And to this day, all over the world, they still do. Nothing can separate us from the love of Jesus. If our God is for us, we are not alone. But Jesus promised more, that those who suffer for his name's sake would not be forgotten, not by God, and not by the family of God. The Voice of the Martyrs was founded by a persecuted Christian as well. Richard Wormbrand reached out for Christ to the Nazis in the early 1940s when they came into his native Romania. He felt a calling to reach out to atheists for Christ. He prayed for opportunities to share Christ with the Russians as well. And when the Soviet communists entered into Romania in 1944, they came right to his doorstep. Richard boldly witnessed to them as well. And just as Jesus promised, they hated him for it. He was arrested and sent to prison for a total of 14 years, often in solitary confinement, often tortured. Through it all, he held on to his love for God and committed to witness for Christ in word and deed even to his torturers. In 1967, Richard, now free from jail and out of Romania, founded an organization committed to sharing the stories of others who, like him, were being jailed, persecuted, tortured, or killed for their faith. He often quoted Hebrews 13.3, Remember those in prison as if you were in prison with them. That organization today is operating in 68 countries around the world, in regions that are dangerous, in countries that are restricted, reaching out through persecution response, through Bible distribution, and through frontline ministry. That organization is committed to stand with their persecuted family by saying, we will not let them suffer in silence. We will not let them serve alone. What is life like in prison in Iran? The first thing I'm gonna tell you is about the goodness of God. That God is still good even when we don't feel it. That God is still good even when we can't see it. The very first thing I did in prison is I cried out to God, God, how long will I be here? And I felt God speak to my heart these simple words, you're going to be here for nine weeks. And I was like, I rebuke that in Jesus' name. You know, sometimes you get it wrong. <clears throat> Maybe the nine was right, you know? Maybe it was nine minutes. <laughs> I never knew how long I would be there. But the day that I was released was nine weeks to the minute exactly when God said. Why? Because it's all about God. <laughs> my cell, my cell was three by four yards. I was in isolation the whole time, lying on the floor. There was no mattress. There was a toilet and a sink and a big steel door with a peak hole. And that was my world. So what do you do in prison? Well, you get bored. <laughs> I remember going for walks every day like this, one, two, three, four, and turning around. But that got old. <laughs> they would come to me twice a day with food. They would open the door, and I had a little plate, and I would stick it out, and they would put food on there, sometimes rice, sometimes vegetables. I remember that first day, they gave me three sugar cubes. And I'm like, oh, I wonder what that's for. <laughs> And then they gave me a cup of tea, and I thought, oh, I bet it's for the tea. Well, I thought to myself, well, I don't need to put it in the tea. I can save the sugar cube, because <laughs> you never know when you need a sugar cube. <laughs> so that's what I did. Well, every day they gave me more sugar cubes. So finally, one day, I got bold. And I realized they were taking the sugar cubes from a box on a cart. So I'm like, can I have a whole box of sugar cubes? They're like, sure, ha <laughs> ha. And I had over a thousand sugar cubes. There was so much fun to have with sugar cubes. Forget Legos. <laughs> I used to play with these sugar cubes, make buildings, make all kinds of towers. I remember the guards used to walk by, and sometimes when I was building, they would look at me and go, uh-oh, <laughs> this guy's been here too long. <laughs> uh, it's good to laugh. It's good to look back at hard times in life and see that in the midst of it, there were some fun things. 
But to be honest with you, prison was the hardest time in my life. If God loves Dan, then why is it Dan in prison? If God's for Dan, if God's strong, why would he let him sit here? And with that came depression and heaviness. I found out I had two death sentences on my life. One for being a missionary, one for being a spy. And as that began to settle in, I began to realize I might be there a long time. And the depression just got worse and worse and worse. It was about two and a half weeks in that the depression hit that the bottom of my heart, probably the worst day of my life. And I'll tell you about this day because of the end of the day. But I woke up one day and I was done. I was done. I did not want to spend the rest of my life there. And I remember as I sat in the room that day, I felt like this word came into my mind, Dan, check out, check out. And all of a sudden I had an idea. I could take my sock and put it in the sink and I could fill it with water. If I filled it with water, I could take my head and put it under the water. And then I could take a towel and tie it to one end of the sink pulling it over my head and then tying the other end. And if I tie it really, really tight with my head pressing into the water, six, seven minutes when I start to gag, I won't be able to untie it fast enough. And I thought to myself, Dan, this will work. Get out of here. And four times I tried. And every time I tried, I was too scared. I was too scared to tie the towel tight. So when I would start to gag, I could untie it. And I'll never forget the last time. Again, I tried, but I couldn't do it. And as I jerked my head out, something happened. And I fell to the ground. If I was ever aware of my brokenness, I was aware of my brokenness on that day. If I ever felt shame, I felt shame on that day. And I lied there on the ground, and all of a sudden, something happened. And the room starts to shake. As it starts to shake, I lift my head, and the room became a glorious white light. I've had a few visions in my life, and this was one of them. As I stared into the white light, I had a vision of Jesus. He was standing there in front of me, but his face wasn't angry. His face was full of kindness, full of love and acceptance. And as I stared in this very caring, kind face, I saw these hands come underneath me, and then these words came out of his mouth, Dan, I still want you. Dan, I still like you. And if you let me, I'll take care of you. And from that day until today, I've never had those thoughts again. God did not just rescue me from prison, no. God rescued me from me that in the midst of my pain, that in the midst of my challenges, he still wanted me because he's that good. Life went on in prison. My friend was released after five weeks. He had a phone call from Nelson Mandela. South Africa, I guess, is one of the biggest buyers of Iranian oil and he got out in 24 hours. And yet I continued. And yet, as I continued, I did get to see the goodness of God. Let me tell you a couple of stories, all glory to Jesus. They took me out of my cell one day, and they put me onto a van. As they took me in the van, they said, you're going to a courthouse. As I walked in, they said, oh, it's your trial. I'm like, what? They said, oh, today you have a trial. I didn't even know. I walk into a courtroom similar to that we might see on TV as a courtroom. Lots of people, video cameras. I'm standing there in my prison clothes on the, the witness stand. And in walks a judge. And the judge looks at me and he says this. He said, sir, you have two death sentences on your life. Tell us today why. Why did you come to Iran? I would love to tell you I was not scared. No, I was so scared. <laughs> and as I was shaking, something happened. All I can say is Jesus. And a scripture from Matthew 10, 19 comes into my mind. Do not be afraid when you're called before the authorities. For at that time, I'll give you the words to say. 
And I looked at the man and I said, sir, I came here to tell you about Jesus Christ. And I'm like, what did I say? And as I said it, something rose up within me. And the fears that I'd struggled with, the fears that I had started to fall away. And the truth of what I really believed started to come out. And I said it a second time and a third time. And I ended up preaching over half an hour. I'm like, Jesus loves you, and he loves you, and he loves you. And maybe you're wondering why you're here today. Well, Jesus loves you, and he loves you, and I just got going. In the middle of my sermon, unplanned, I realized something else. I was free. I was free. Why? Because you can't kill a dead man. You can't kill a dead man. I'd given my life so many times to Jesus. So what if they kill me? My home is heaven, and I'm going home to heaven. And they can kill this body, but they cannot touch what God's done in my heart. And I kept preaching. <laughs> they didn't kill me, <laughs> in case you're wondering. <laughs> One of the most special moments of my life. Let me tell you another special thing God did in my heart. This was more progression, not all at once. The very first day I was beaten by a man, it turns out I would be beaten by him every day for the following weeks and never by anybody else. And the very first day he's beating me, I felt like the Holy Spirit speak to me and say, Dan, I want to teach you to love your enemies. And I'm thinking it's not a good time. <laughs> not a good time. And God says it again, Dan, I want to teach you to love your enemies. And all this injustice is in my mind, in my heart, like, wait a minute, how could I love this guy? He's not letting me see my embassy. He's doing everything that's totally unjust. And I'm like, Jesus, how do I love him? And then Jesus said this. He said, Dan, ask me what I think of him. And God changed the subject. I love when God changes the subject. Yes, we're on his mind, but also on God's mind is his love for everybody else. And I looked up to Jesus. I'm like, God, what do you think of this man? And the love of God hit me. I knew that God knew his name. He knew the name of his wife. He knew the name of his kids. He'd always loved him. There was only one challenge, and it was that he didn't know it yet. And I'm like, God, you really love him. He's like, Dan, more than you'll ever know. And I'm like, God, change my heart. Change my heart. And all glory to Jesus over the coming weeks, he changed my heart. I started to bless this man and say good things about him. I'll never forget the last day I saw him. I had no idea it would be the last day I'd see him. They take me into the interrogation room. It was a scary room. Every day I would always shake. He would take off my blindfold, just him standing there, blood stains on the floor. I'd get ready for a beating. But on that day, something happened. All I can say is Jesus. And I looked at him and I said this. I said, sir, if I'm going to see you every day the rest of my life, let's become friends. He was like, what? <laughs> I said, yeah, we see each other every day. Let's be friends. He's like, no, sir, we will never be friends. I said, no, sir, today things change. Today we become friends. He's like, never. And something rose up within me. And I'm like, no, sir, today we become friends. And you can start by telling me your name. He had never told me his name. He had never called me by my name because my name was 58 because that was the number of my room. And I stuck out my hand like this to shake his hand. I said, sir, let's be friends. And that's when he froze. And when he froze, he starts to shake. As he's shaking, he takes his hand out of his pocket, and he shook my hand. When he shook my hand, he wouldn't let go. Tears started to roll down his face. And then he looks at me and he says, Dan. And he called me by my name. He said, my name is Razak, and I would love to be your friend. 
There is no heart too hard for Jesus. Jesus can change the hardest heart. He wiped the tears from his eyes. He's like, Dan, I'm so glad we're friends. I'm like, yeah, me too. <laughs> He's like, Dan, I'm so, so sorry. You know, I don't make the decision to get you out. I said, I know that. He's like, yeah, but I have some authority over your daily life here. Is there anything you need? And I'm like, yeah, we need a bigger room, more room for my sugar cube buildings. <laughs> He's like, you got a lot of sugar cubes? I'm like, yep. <laughs> He's like, let me see what I can do. And I've never seen that man again in my life. Later that night, the guards came to my room and they said, sir, we have orders to move you to a bigger cell. And I knew that God had changed that man's heart because there's no heart too hard for Jesus. And life went on. One day, they took me out of my room and put me on a bus. This time, they put me next to an African man. And I thought to myself, maybe he speaks English. I said, sir, do you speak English? He said, yes, I do. And I recognized the accent. I'm like, where are you from? He's like, Louisiana. <laughs> I'm like, dude, what's up? What's up? I'm an American, too. He's like, what's up? I said, how long you been here? He's like, 15 months. I'm like, you're joking. He's like, no, 15 months. I said, why? He's like, I don't know. At that moment, they heard us talking and they separated us and I've never seen that man again in my life. I do know he got out of prison. He got out a few months after me. Now, I'll never forget that night. Every night I would dream of maybe getting out. And I didn't care how I got out, you know? <laughs> Brad Pitt or Matt Damon with a rope from the ceiling. That works. Or what about, you know, the book of Acts with an angel at the door, you know? But that night I got really real. Like Dan, he's an American. He's been here 15 months. What if you're here 15 months? What if you're here two years, Dan? Five years? 10 years? What if this is it, Dan? And I remember that night sitting in my cell and I just wanted one thing from God and it was simply this, is I just wanted to understand. I just wanted to understand how this could be the plan. So I cried out to Jesus, Jesus, help, oh, help me see, like why? Why would I sit here the rest of my life? And God said nothing. God said nothing. And I'll never forget, hours into the night, must have been three, four in the morning, I finally gave up control. I said, God, I want to trust you. I want to trust you with what I don't see. I want to trust you with what makes no sense. And I don't know how long I'll be here. I don't know why you would allow me to be here. But I trust you. I trust you. And wonderful Jesus won my heart again. I love when Jesus wins my heart again. He's always got something good for us because he's really good. Often when he surprises us with his wooing us to himself, it's because he has another surprise right around the corner. And for me, it was literally three hours later. They came to my room. They said, gather your things. I didn't have many things. <laughs> Sugar cubes. I put them all in my blanket. They led me down the hallway and they said to get dressed. As I walked into this room, to my surprise, it was my clothes. I'm like, what? I was thinking to wear another prison clothes, but my clothes, why are they making me get dressed? They didn't fit, I lost 55 pounds. <laughs> So I'm holding my jeans like this, thinking the reason maybe they're making me get dressed, it might be my day of execution. They walk me outside, put me on a bus. They take me to the courthouse, but this time not to a courtroom, this time to a simple office. As I walk in and I sit down, in walks a man. Turns out he's the head judge of all the courts of Iran. He walks in and he says this. He said, today, as we've been working with the Swiss embassy, we choose to release Dan Bauman, and he's a free man. 
And I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm thinking I'm going to die. And Jesus was like, surprise, ha <laughs> the best surprise ever. Tears streaming down my face as I stood up. A man walks up to me. Turns out he's a Swiss ambassador. He's like, sir, you're coming with me. And I'm like, yes, sir. <laughs> and we walk to the door. As we get to the door, the judge walks up to me. In the Iranian culture, which is the same as the Afghan culture, it's hello or goodbye between an acquaintance is a handshake. But they do something else if you're close, like there's a deep bond of friendship. And that would be a handshake and drawing each other in with three kisses, cheek to cheek to cheek. But you would only do that if you're like, there's a tight bond when you're saying goodbye because you're good friends. As I walked out, the main judge walks up to me, the man who hated me the most, the man who wanted me dead, and he grabbed my hand and he gave me three kisses. And it was God's way of saying I've changed his heart as well. Because there's no heart to heart for Jesus. I got in that ambassador's car and I locked those doors. We got to his embassy. I recommend it. <laughs> He's like, you'll be my guest for three days. And then we have to get you to the airport. I found out that I was released from prison by an executive order of the president of Iran. That's how I got out. He's like, Dan, many people were against it. So we got to get you out of here so that you're really free. They finally got me on an airplane to Frankfurt with a connecting flight down to Zurich, where my dad was from, Switzerland. I get to the airport and I'm so nervous. I have my little bag, you know. I finally get on the plane. I'm sitting on the plane shaking, knowing that we're still in Iran. And the plane took off. We finally landed in Frankfurt and I was free. As I was there, they had offered us a free meal for those that had been on the plane and wanting to have the time to have a special breakfast. So they invited us in to have that because we had been delayed on the flight. So I decided to do it. So I got my breakfast. As I got my breakfast, I looking around, it looked like a lot of Iranians from the flight. And I'm looking around and I see one table is empty with one empty chair. So I look at the chair and I look like this and I go sit down. As I'm eating, all of a sudden, one of the Iranians looks at me and says, you look familiar. I said, do you speak English? They said, yeah, we're all Iranian and we all speak English. And you look, look like you just came on a flight from Iran. I said, yeah, yes, I did. He's like, oh, did you have a good time? <laughs> I'm like, well, <laughs> the first two weeks were good. He's like, oh, tell me about it. So I told him, yeah, the first two weeks, we went to this city and this city and enjoyed these sites. They're like, awesome, awesome. They said, how long were you there? I said, oh, I was there 11 weeks. They said, oh, you said the first two weeks were good. I said, yeah, they were great. <laughs> they said, where were you the last nine weeks? And I'm like, that's a direct question. <laughs> and I remember just sitting there in the Holy Spirit saying, be honest. The word Evin would be a household name in Iran, the main notorious prison. And I looked at them and I said, I spent nine weeks in Evin. And they look at me and they're like, are you Daniel Bauman? I'm like, yeah, how do you know my name? They said, oh, every week we get a paper from the government. And they said they caught an American spy named Daniel Bauman. But we know that you're not a spy. And we don't agree with a lot of what our government does. And for the next 15 minutes, they ask me the most loving, loving questions. Did they hurt you? Could you go outside? Why did they do this? Very loving questions. And I finally heard my flight being called and I had to leave. I said, I'm so sorry I have to go. But thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing your heart with me. They're like, no, sir, before you go, we want you to know this. We are so, so sorry for what our government did to you. That is not the heart of the Iranian people. And I love Iran. <laughs> ha ha. 
And I got on my flight and landed in Switzerland. My parents came, my friend from South Africa came and God gave me freedom again. Freedom to look at the sky. Freedom to go for a walk. Freedom to use a cell phone. All the freedoms in life I taken for granted, God gave them all back to me. But the greatest freedom God gave me back is I got to enjoy Jesus. I got to walk with Jesus. I got to follow the lover of my soul and be with him because he's really, really, really good. I flew back to America. So many doors opened. God brought me so much healing from PTSD. And over time, God's heart for the world just kept growing in my heart. Since that time, I've been traveling and teaching all over the world. I go back to the Middle East a lot. I go to Afghanistan twice a year where I used to work. I was there actually earlier this year. I've been many times to Syria and Iraq and many times to Saudi Arabia and all across that part of the world. If you look on a map, I've been all around Iran. <laughs> People ask me, you going back to Iran? <laughs> Not today. Will I ever go back to Iran? Oh yeah, I hope so. Why? It's really simple. It's really simple. The more I discover the love of God, the more I discover a God who likes me, the more I discover a God who can rescue me from the lowest moments of my life. If I can go to Iran to let them know this good news, oh, I want to do that. It would be such an honor to go that they too can know the beauty of who Jesus is. Uh, he's so, so good. Amen. Let's pray. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, so much for this moment to be able to share your goodness with your people. I thank you, God, that you're really, really good. You not only rescued me, God, from prison, but you rescued me from me. Thank you. We pray your blessing, God, and your help and strength for all those that are suffering today around the world. Lord, maybe there are those that, God, are suffering with something they just don't see a way out, but they don't see an answer. God, if you can rescue me from prison in Iran, you can rescue people from whatever they're going through. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs>